is which way to evolution, what are our differences? Uh, and I'm hoping that our two speakers tonight will uh, elucidate and make the differences and similarities as clear as possible. The general format is we're going to talk in about 15, 20 minutes each. Then we'll talk, open it out to questions and contributions from the floor. And that's going to go on for about half an hour or <coughs> as long as necessary, but within reason. Uh, and then at the end, there'll be a brief collection. Uh, although, the, although the room doesn't cost anything, you do have to pay for upkeep. So please be generous. Uh, and I hope you enjoy yourselves. And obviously, there'll be general milling about and discussion afterwards as well if you want. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Ian Paul. Um, well, comrades, and I do mean comrades, and all the time for the SPGP, um, very nice people. Um, I was just talking to Howard about, um, I think they were one of the first political groups outside anarchists I ever met in Swansea in the early 70s. It was a very good group of SPGBers there. We were all hippies, so in our, um, our local hippie news sheet, and none of the other leftists would talk to us, but the SPGB did. And they're all about 108 years old, as I recall. <laughs> <laughs> and very striking, a very striking man with a wing collar. Very, and they were all very friendly. And it was totally incongruous for us sort of long-haired hippies to be talking to these very uh, <coughs> SPG beers. But we always had a chat, they were throwing the socialist stand. I've also got a lot of time for people who sell papers on the streets, having spent about 40 years doing it. So it's nice to see people out flogging the paper. But it's more than that. I think the SPG, most of the people I've met in the Socialist Party of Great Britain, have been the kind of people who could actually live in a socialist society. There's not many people on the left, I think I can say that, but most of it. Most of the left are pretty horrible people. Um, they might be campaigning for socialism, but you knew they'd never lift a fucking finger once they were right. <laughs> Whereas I think the SPG will actually get stuck in and do the document. I think they genuinely want socialism and will be nice people and will you know, do their bit. Uh, I've got a, a rating of left groups. A, a nice honour to yes, the Socialist Workers Party the worst, the most sectarian, horrible, plotting, scheming, and militant, or so, the other socialist but not, whatever it's called these days, a variant of the Socialist Party. They tend to be all nice, work, all solid working class people, not sort of like the SWP, very, very pretty decent people, and I think the yeah, Socialist Party of Great Britain on the, on the end is a nice honour to. So that's enough of compliments, comrades. <laughs> yeah, let's stick the boot in. <laughs> we also, I think we share a lot of things in common, um, politically, ideologically. We, we believe in mass work for the last week with the change society. We don't believe in vanguards, we don't believe in revolutionary parties. Um, we don't believe a small minority can bounce or kick people into a revolution. It has to be something which people want, the mass of people have to want, and want to carry through, be aware of, be aware of what socialism is, want it, campaign for it, not achieve it in a, in a, in a sort of coup d'etat or vanguard party season as a small minority. The genuine movement of the people, by the people, for the people, and I think we share that in common. I mean, if I'm speaking on behalf of class war, which I <laughs> maybe I am tonight, Class war aren't really traditional anarchists to some extent. So some of the arguments you've probably got well, I'm sure you're well versed in arguing with anarchists over here. Some of the arguments may not wash so much. Class was a it's not a cohesive group like the Socialist Party of Great Britain is we all all very ideologically homogenous and we all sing from the same song sheet. And anyone who doesn't is ruthlessly expelled. <laughs> <laughs> Class was much more of a ragbag of people who call themselves many different names, certainly some anarchists, and a whole lot of other names. Some people call themselves council communists, some would call themselves workers councillors, some left communists, some autonomists, some situationists, um, libertarian Marxists, libertarian socialists. Um, so that's one of the, one of the, uh, the, the good things about class war, I think. We didn't exist on the past what we don't, and we didn't in its heyday in the 80s insist on a party line and there was widespread difference of opinion was tolerated uh, and, and welcomed and there was a lot of genuine debate and no one was ever expelled for forming a faction within the class war. They expelled for lots of other reasons but forming a faction was one of them. Now my worries about new comrades are, are as follows. Oh sorry, I'm sorry, there's one other thing we share in common and that is the history of failure. <laughs> we have both failed. 
Class War has failed to overthrow society in the act of payments and cheap libertarian socialism. And you've failed because you haven't achieved your goals either. However, your failure is greater than ours because you've been going longer. Uh, <laughs> 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 if we multiply these signs, uh, your failures are possibly three times greater than mine. <laughs> However, I'm concerned about you, comrades. I don't think your lives are exciting enough. <laughs> You've only got one goal, which is the achievement of socialism. Um, and it's like, it's like um, an orgasm you're waiting to achieve, but it's taken a bloody long time to come. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not good for your health, comrade. <laughs> now, you, because you reject any, anything else as reformers, we don't indulge in any sort of foreplay uh, prior to orgasm, but we do. So we get some fun from foreplay by doing things like poll tax riot. We consider the poll tax riot one of our fine achievements. We took part in, not just us, obviously. Um, we do other things. We, we attack the rich and kick their hampers into the River Thames at Henley. <laughs> we do nasty to rich people very often. <laughs> and we've done loads of other things, along, which, has brought us lot of, you know, which has brought us a lot of pleasure. But I fear that you lot don't get any pleasure because you reject all these things on the way. And I feel you're going to get pent up and become bitter and twisted because you never can get there. I think that one of the reasons for that is that um, you tend to believe everyone's rational and that we'll be rational and if, if you put the case for socialism, people will say, I mean, and it is an unassailable case for socialism. Rationally, the arguments will be made are unassailable. You know, 2% of the people only might be less, 6% of the means of production is in anyone's eyes an inequitable, unjust, unfair system in the misery way of the world. But explaining that to people don't work. If it did, if it did we'd have had socialism many a long time ago. Because people are composed of all sorts of elements besides rationality. You know, emotions, irrationality, all sorts of things go on their lives. And I fear, because of your revolutionary purity, you never would appeal to real people with real emotions and other desires. Um, which make up their personalities and their attitudes to politics as much as the rationality um, thing does. Um, and I fear also that standing on the side and branding everything but defining the achievement of socialism as reformist um, is not good for your health either. Because, in, well, I don't know why it's not good for your health and why it's not good for other people's health. But basically, lots of things happen which improve the quality of life but you choose not to take part in any of them, to campaign for them, but you benefit from the results. For example, a big of the big irrationality of the century, perhaps, is the Second World War. Now, correct me, I'm sure some of the SPG will correct me if I'm wrong. As I understand it, you opposed it as a war between two um, equally bad forces uh, and refused to support uh, the fight against fascism in World War II. So, World War II was basically started by the, the cause on our side was the English aristocracy and the old style Tory party. But by the end of the war, it was the working class that won the fucking war. It was the working class that fought the war, money. And you played no part in it. And you benefited from the outcome. Because if you hadn't benefited, if Hitler had won, you would have been wiped out. So you benefited from the, the struggle. You refused to take part in it with a crystal pure attitude. Um, but lots of other people saved your bacon, basically. Sometimes the SBGB reminds me of the, the kid's story of the little red hen. Who will help me build this house? Not I said the SBGB, and so on and so on. Who will help me share the final fruits of socialism? I will say the SBGB. Laughing there, anyway. <laughs> 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 it really me, it's, 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 and I'll, 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 this is the final point I'm going to make really. Is what is the content of socialism? I mean, is socialism something which is just, you know, you'll be well used to the anarchist arguments over the parliamentary democracy, win a majority, and institute socialism. I'm sure you're well versed in arguing those things. But how do people become socialists? 
And what, what is the content of their socialism? I mean, socialism is the total transformation of everything, all aspects of life. It's exciting, it's imaginative, it's inspiring. People take on managing all aspects of their lives. It's self-management, it's community control, it's all those things. Now, how, do they, how do they come about by simple, <coughs> how does the new socialist person ridding themselves of old values come about? Merely by the electoral victory in Parliament. I mean, without any pre-work being done. What are the pre you know, the prefigurative forms of struggle? By engaging in struggle and throwing up new forms of struggle, for example, Soviets in 1917, workers' councils in Hungary in 56, or the Democratic Organisation of Society in Spain in 1936. Well, you've, by engaging in struggle and throwing up those forms of workers' power, these are prefigurative forms of the way society will be. But you know, for instance, you don't engage in any prior struggle apart from rationally explaining to people that the case of socialism. None of these, none of these organs of working class power thrown up. So how will working class power um, manifest itself? What form will it take? How will people be ready for it? And will it be exciting? Will it be imaginative? Will it be bold? Will it be striking? Will it just be something miserableist? You know, on a part of the the workerism of the, uh, the Soviet Union. Will it be heavy, exciting days? I fear not. I fear that uh, that's what socialism really is, exciting, demanding, it demands everything of us, we get swept away with it. Anyone who's talked about a revolutionary moment in history will talk about how everything changes overnight, relationships change, the way people see things change, uh, everything changes. Um, but I fear that your socialism is reduced to watching Newsnight by-election special and Michael Crick moving the swing on the table and saying now we have a majority for socialism. And everyone turns their televisions off and wakes up the following morning exactly the same as they were before socialism made a majority. Thank you, comrades. Together rational. Um, I sort of take that up from his uh, the recent autobiography he's published. Sure. Um, people know it, Bash the Rich. It's, 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 an, it's an excellent read. Among other things, it's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, it's serious as well. And uh, the point he makes about people not being very rational is sort of looked at in there very interestingly. And uh, he draws on. Um, a writer I remember from my sort of younger days called Maurice Brinton, who wrote this this this, uh, this work called The Irrational in Politics. It's interesting, and it's something that something the Socialist Party should think about. Anyway, um, I won't sort of attempt to respond directly to what Ian said uh, at the moment. You know, we can uh, we can have sort of significant discussion afterwards. But uh, I'll just say a few words about uh, as Ian did really uh, about the way it seems to me that. Uh, Socialist Party and class war differ in their view of things, uh, and indeed how they're similar. And I remember Ian from many years ago in Swansea. Uh, I, I used to sell the Socialist Standard in the shopping precinct there, uh, while Ian was selling a publication called Alarm. You remember that, of course, because uh, he founded it. It was a, a magazine which exposed local scandals and corruption in the area. And it was a hell of a good read. Loads of people read it. Uh, and loads of people uh, uh, like reading it. Uh, I didn't think it was a lot to do with revolution of any kind, or at least the kind of revolution that, uh, uh, being in the Socialist Party I wanted, uh, the kind of revolution that would lead to a moneyless, wageless, frontierless world society, an entirely democratic society of free access and voluntary cooperation. In other words, socialism was understood by the Socialist Party. Now, in later years, I often got hold of the, what you might call the successor to Alarm, uh, the newspaper called Class War, which Ian also founded to his great credit. Uh, some people, I've uh, got a copy here, recent copy, I, don't, I suspect you didn't have anything to do with this particular one, uh, but uh, it's still being published, Class War. Um, and um, that was and is sort of more broadly political than Alarm was. Um, 
loads of people liked it, even if they didn't sort of fully agree with what it was saying. What it was saying, they liked it for its, its rebelliousness, its total disrespect for authority, its very, very rude hostility to the system we love under, uh, we live under, and, and to the holders of that system. Um, you might say for its willingness to say the unsayable. Uh, I also liked it for its opposition to the opposition. That is, its condemnation of the traditional left for its reformism. A bit surprised to hear what Ian said just now about reformism because uh, certainly this was a newspaper which opposed uh, the reformists who seized on all sorts of sort of passing facts and supported certain countries that happened to call themselves socialists like China and Cuba, uh, the countries which were un unquestionably part of the world capitalist system. But I still didn't think class war, what it said, was a lot to do with socialism in the terms that uh, the Socialist Party describes it. However, later on I got a hold of a book published by class war, and perhaps written by Ian, I don't know, it's called Unfinished Business. No, not written by Ian, okay. But reflecting anyway uh, the views of class war, uh, Unfinished Business, the politics of class war, and... Uh, Class War still were advertised in, um, in their newspaper. And that changed my tune because, or at least to a certain extent it did, because I read various things in it, such as the following. Uh, I've sort of written them down here, so I won't sort of, uh, try to find them in the book and quote directly, but uh, one of the things it says was, just by its existence, money is, the, is a measure of the failure of society to organize the production of goods and services for the benefit of all. It has to go. Then. We seek to do away with artificial boundaries and borders. The world will not be divided into countries or states. Capitalism should be replaced by a way of life that takes as its first principle from each according to their ability and to each according to their need. Also, uh, it says, we believe that the material means to enable everybody in this world to have enough of everything for a good life are already in existence. All that remains is to take control out of the hands of the few and put it in the hands of the people. Uh, we can achieve a society where nobody can claim to own the means of production, where all human creation and invention are part of a common, our common heritage and so belong to everyone. And finally, selfishness, competition and bigotry will be replaced by awareness, understanding and an attitude best described by the saying, all for one and one for all. Wow, uh, nothing there that the Socialist Party could disagree with, on the contrary. Now, obviously, this did therefore make me think that class war was at least something to do with socialism because it was advocating just about the same thing. And I won't deny that this was a surprise given my previous take on class war from reading the newspaper. So here was an organisation which, while it didn't call itself socialist, if anything it called itself anarchist, uh, but it did seem to share the, the goals of the Socialist Party. Now, there's a but here, of course, because as well as um, this book, Unfinished Business, I was still reading the newspaper produced by Class War, the newspaper which didn't seem to be saying these things, and was mainly, and I'm sure Ian will confirm this, because he, he wrote most of it, was mainly talking about violent street demonstrations and putting coppers in hospital. And Unfinished Business, apart from the things I've just read out, did say a lot of those things too. Um, and um, things which can't be reconciled with the case of the Socialist Party. And I think two things, two differences in particular, stand out from all this between the two organisations. And I think they can be summed up in two words. And the first word is class, and the second word is violence. Class and violence. And uh, I'll just spend uh, a short time explaining what I mean by this because I think these two elements go right to the heart of things. First of all, class. The view of the Socialist Party is that there are two classes in modern society. One, the working or wage earning class, and two, the capitalist or owning class. And everyone who depends for their living on a wage or salary is a member of that first class, the working class, the wage earning class, the wage earning class. And everyone who doesn't depend on a wage for their salary because they own or control enough wealth is a member of the second class, the capitalist class, or the owning class. On that basis, it goes without saying 
that the vast majority of us belong to that first class and a very small minority indeed to the second one. The wealth of that second class, the capitalist class, derives from the work of the first one. Whatever that work may be, it follows from this that there's an inevitable conflict of interest between these two classes in that workers try to get the best price possible, the highest pay they can when they sell their mental and physical energies, while capitalists seek to maximize their benefits, that is, the profit they make from employing us, from employing workers. And this conflict of interest manifests itself in all sorts of different ways and can only ultimately be resolved by the majority class understanding their position. Uh, most of them don't, uh, but understanding their position and deciding to take action in order to, to change things, to take over the running of society and set up a society along the lines I've already talked about. Now, class war shares that last objective, the kind of society I've talked about clearly. You, uh, if you read their, uh, uh, if you read what they say in, uh, in their uh, manifesto, uh, but they clearly take a different view of class from the Socialist Party. So while the Socialist Party has what you might call a two-class view, class war has a three-class one. Fundamental to class war's view of the world and capitalism, and, and, and including it in the book as well as in the newspaper, is the idea that there are not two but three classes in society. Not just working class and capitalist class, but middle class too. And the middle class consists of people like me, actually, teachers, um, researchers, doctors, social workers, civil servants, journalists, managers, etc. Um, uh, those, I suppose, who might be referred to by many people as professionals. And in class wars language, in class wars sort of quite rude language, get referred to in various other ways, such as, such, as, such as yuppies, posh bastards, friendly wankers, backstabbing hypocrites, etc. Fair enough. Um, uh, in the words of their, their, their statement of position in their newspaper, you know, in this recent issue of their newspaper I've got, uh, according to them, the middle class do the dirty work of controlling and organizing or disorganizing the working class. And their role, as Ian himself puts it in, in Bash the Rich, um, is propping up the system they allegedly despise. So these people are seen in class wars view as facilitators, as aiders and abettors, as collaborators in the capitalist exploitation of workers as not having revolutionary potential and therefore presumably needing to be defeated along with the capitalist class in order for a transformation of society to be brought about. Now, while the Socialist Party would recognize that for some purposes it might be useful to identify the kind of people mentioned here as, as middle class, it might be, for example, if you, if you want to sort of look at pay people over in capitalism, that kind of thing, uh, we would reject the idea that they are in a fundamentally different position with regard to ownership of wealth than workers in other kinds of jobs. And I think we'd argue, well, we'd certainly argue that to regard them as different in this way is misleading, and it's a needless complication when it comes to understanding society. And this underlies the important difference between so socialist party and class war when it comes to looking at how revolution can be brought about. And this difference will, I hope, become clear when I say a final word now about the second of the two differences I referred to earlier, and that is violence. The first is class, second violence. So difference number two, violence. Socialist Party's position on violence with regard to how socialism can be achieved is that violence is undesirable and probably unnecessary. Our view is that you only achieve socialism the society of free access and voluntary cooperation when the majority of people want it. And when they do, and he said a little bit about this, uh, somewhat disparaging now I know, but uh, we can talk about this later, uh, when people want it, they won't need violence to get it, since they, they'll be able to use the machinery that capitalism has already been forced to establish for its own organisation, in particular, but maybe not exclusively, the ballot box. Only then, if at some point 
a, major, a minority is prepared to use violence to try and, to try and thwart the majority, will there be, would there be any need to use force or the threat of force or, 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 or whatever else, whatever other means um, uh, might need to be used. Uh, now, we're aware of the objections that uh, some people, including anarchists and including Ian, indeed, may have to this. We've heard them many times, and we think we've answered them many times, but uh, I'll leave that for discussion because I'm sure it will arise. Now, class war's position on violence, and I'll be corrected if I'm wrong here, is that it's misguided to think we can change things by peaceful democratic action, by voting, uh, for example and that violence is therefore a necessary and inevitable means to achieve the revolutionary objective, since there will automatically be a violent reaction to a growing revolution movement as it develops and grows stronger. Early on uh, in Unfinished Business, uh, it stated boldly, revolution means civil war. And uh, in last war, uh, the statement of position, uh, which is included, uh, I think every issue, uh, the manifesto, if you like, says violence is a necessary part of the class war. So the class war view seems to be that a majority will to establish the new society will not be allowed to express itself without coming up against violence engendered by the privileged minority who will have on their side their, their accomplices, the middle class who, in this view, and it's also in the, in the book here, they say make up around 20% of the population. And here's the connection between that aspect, aspect of class wars theory and the need they see for violence. If what they see as the middle class will always side with the capitalist class, then there'll always be significant opposition to social revolution. At least 20% may, may, may be more than that. Well, as I've said, we disagree with that. There definitely is a class war in capitalist society, but not that kind of class war. We also reject, and this sort of touches on something else even said uh, a few minutes ago, we would also reject class wars called to violent action, to fun if you like, uh, as, as I think Ian sees it and uh, his book uh, graphically sort of details it, uh, to violent action in the, in the current society, which they see as a necessary expression a day-to-day -day resistance to the system. Um, and also, as Ian put it, on the foreplay. <laughs> and, and we reject that on the grounds that it's futile and that there's no evidence, uh, contrary to what uh, Ian was suggesting, there's no evidence it helps to radicalize people or spread revolutionary ideas among them. So these are the main differences, I think. They may seem pretty large, but our objective at least seems to be the same, so they may not be as fundamental as we think, and from what Ian said, I, uh, that sort of seems to uh, confirm they're not. And if we sort of proceed to discuss them now, perhaps we can learn from one another. Uh, uh, Ian said he, he always liked the Socialist Party and the people in it and a lot of things they were saying, and Class War's own website, uh, which uh, I don't think Ian have, uh, has anything to do with now, does say the following about the Socialist Party. Despite the name, they're not authoritarians. They are, in fact, pretty cool. Check, <laughs> check out their newspaper. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs> right, so despite not being authoritarians, I'm a pretty ruthless chair. Uh, so please uh, make sure everyone can uh, be heard. Um, I'll probably give precedence to visitors and people I don't think necessarily members to try and hopefully ensure a bit of balance. Um, please do come forward with either contributions or questions, because otherwise I'm just going to sit here and bounce questions at them, and you'll all get very bored of my voice. So do I see any hands? Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about the, the definition of the majority and the use of the ballot. Uh, and obviously the, the party sees the use of the ballot, and how other anti-parliamentarians see the views of the or whatever. So, uh, I mean, on the one hand, you've got the left-wing Germans, and especially SWP, uh, well, they used to say it, they're not saying it now. Uh, don't let the parliament, don't let the parliament, whatever you do, you let the parliament, and it's done the song you 
you're going to end up automatically being part and parcel of the capitalist system. Well, fair, fair enough. We take that view and so well. Uh, parties here says that we contest elections. Knowing full well uh, what appeal we've got at the present, that we're not going to achieve much. It's merely a, uh, our election campaigns are merely a propaganda exercises. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to get the case across, and it, uh, because it's an election, it, uh, it highlights the possibility of uh, striking home somewhere uh, amongst the working class. But at the end of the day, and I hate using that term, in regards to socialism, and particularly in, way, in the way that socialism is achieved, right? whether it's through the parliamentary board or through direct, direct action outside the parliament, or which I would much think will, is going to occur, a combination of the two. There's going to be work inside parliament. In other words, if David does come about, and there is a, re a raising of socialist consciousness, you're going to have people getting elected and delegates elected to Parliament, either the, under the auspices of uh, the, the Socialist Party or similar organisations, uh, but the aim, aim will be the same. And then outside Parliament, you're going to have this direct action taking place. Uh, some of it is going to be uh, in accord with capitalism, and it's going to be a uh, more of a call for reforms. And if the standard and uh, the level of uh, class consciousness is high enough, uh, the capitalist class is going to give it to uh, Yes, uh, yeah, we, we, we don't want this so called green revolution field. Uh, have a couple of peanuts, you know, feed yourself for that. Uh, uh, that. That will go on. Uh, and then on the other hand, then you'll have people calling for revolution, like the Socialist Party, like class war, and saying that we need to get at the fundamentals and change uh, the, the direction that society is going in. It's not so-called, uh, it's not progressive in any shape or form. In fact, it, it'll turn down and eat you all up. That's the way capitalism is going. But you achieve the revolution. Revolution comes about. Now, not necessarily through Parliament, but the revolution comes about. The state is taken over, right? It's still held. The state is still going to be held because we still can't trust them capitalist bastards, as class war puts it, coming back and biting us up the ass. We don't want that. No way, shape or form. Right? We don't want them in control of the armed forces. So they can turn around and say the armed forces, we don't take on them. Well, we are going to be in control of the state for the time being. Yes, yeah, necessary. Necessary. Well, right, uh, just, just, let me just come to my point. Huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, my, and my point is this. Right? Come the revolution and you reach that stage of revolutionary activity, at some place and time, the revolution has got to be confirmed. Confirmed. It's got to be confirmed. And the only way you're going to confirm it, to know how much support you've got on your side, is through the ballot. Without the ballot, you've got nothing. And it's very necessary that we have a ballot in order to confirm that the revolution has been taking place and it is being sustained. <laughs> I'm sorry for pointing. Yeah, good question. Uh, um, yeah, well, I'm. Yeah, you seem to be hovering between the, the two strands between class one and the SMG for most of it. And then I was interested in what you said by the end, which I haven't quite appreciated, that, that it's necessary to control the state, which you know brings us to the classic argument between anarchists and Marxists. And it's not necessary for us to control the state, it's necessary for us to abolish the state immediately. The state is an all the class power. It can only ever be an all the class power. If you're talking about capturing the state on behalf of who? You know, still the, the state 
anyone who takes over the state will then start to act in different interests than the class interests. You know, as Bakunin said to Marx, you know, the most revolutionary part of the dictatorship of the proletariat will not be a dictatorship of the proletariat. And what you're talking about, taking over the state, stop the army, taking over, it's all intents and purposes, dictatorship of the proletariat. You know, we, however, you know, it won't be a dictatorship of the proletariat, it'll be a dictatorship over the proletariat. Because who's, you know, who are these people who are going to administer the state? They have separate interests from the, you know, from, from the working class. Who is it going to be? Is it going to be a, a small handful of, of socialist MPs? They who will short, you know, who will have a different class interest than the people they might have been originally elected to represent. The representatives not direct democracy, the government just their own. Um, there's no way the state can be taken over this, you know, we are aware of this argument. I wasn't quite sure that the SPU really took this line. It, it, it was necessary to capture the state. I'm quite surprised. Um, because because that, then we have a clear and fundamental disagreement which goes straight back to the Kuhn and Marx and the role of the Revolutionary Party and the role of the state. The idea of the state will wither away at some point. Is it, you know, if, if anyone could show me in the history of the world where the state has actually withered away. State mechanism, the people who run it, the new ruling class, develop interests of their own separate from the people they allegedly represent. But, you know, it's, a, it's, it's diabolical, Brian. It doesn't mean it. <laughs> it doesn't mean it. Right, well, uh, you seem quite passionate about it at the time. Um, right, so I think, sorry, just again, just want to go back to another thing how I said. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, it's, yeah, and I, I, I'll say that it's quite difficult to argue with Gus or the, the elements that, um, that um, Howard said there, um, about CWR, and the as he says in the book. Personally, I do take a two class position, and I always argue that some of the stuff like the Unpunished Business book was written in the 90s when I was a new class. Well, but I very much agree with you, there's only two classes, and you know, there are elements that look like you know, you're, you know, you're an order giver and an order taker, basically. Um, and there are only two classes, and certainly elements within the working class, and we might abuse as middle class, and they generally tend to be professional revolutionaries which try and identify the working class, but their, their class background is. is so personally, I, I, I concur with your two-class position, but I don't concur with Ryan's desire to take a state over. Yeah. Um, just a comment on this, really. I, I think that maybe there's, there's a sort of differences here because um, uh, what you, I think got to get to grips with is, is a process of, of a sort of revolutionary situation. And the fact is that um, whether, the, as people said, whether it comes to probably, I, I would agree with what Brian said, it's probably come, come, come to a, a combination from the ballot box and actually things happening outside. It cannot come just from the ballot box, that's an impossibility. But the thing is, I, I think when we talk about in the Socialist Party about um, sort of taking over the state, well, I think the main question is what. Uh, once you reach that goal, what's actually going to be left of the state? Is there still going to be an armed forces? I, I think currently, aren't they having trouble to get people to join the armed forces? I can't see people, when this revolutionary process is still going on, that people are going to still be joining the armed forces. I don't think there will be any armed forces left for the capitalist class to use, because of that side that, what you've got to concentrate on is the process. Yeah, um, can I just, just briefly say that um, right, um, I think what Ian drew from what Brian was saying isn't quite what, what Brian was saying. I, I, no, I don't try to spin <laughs> Brian's words. It's quite fair. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, no. no. no, no. no, no. no but the view of the Socialist Party is the state. It's got to get taken over and immediately abolished, basically. That, that, that's the view of the Socialist Party. That immediate. It's immediate. It's immediate. It's immediate. It's absolutely immediate. Uh, I mean, you've got to say, look, look, we're all sort of, you know, looking into crystal balls here, aren't we? I mean, you know, it depends. Obviously, you know, we, we can't say uh, absolutely categorically this will happen or that will happen, but, uh, you know, the, the view of the Socialist Party is that uh, the state has nothing to do at all, with, nothing to do with socialism at all, and uh, uh, immediately or as quickly as possible, it depends, but, but ideally, immediately at the state, once it's taken over, once it's, once it's clear that the majority uh, are for socialism, they, they've, they've expressed the will to have socialism, uh, the state gets abolished and you have a society of from each according to ability to each according to need. I mean, that clearly is the position of the Socialist Party. Uh, sort of suspect it's his position as well. Uh, and uh, as um, Ray, Ray just said there, um, none of us know exactly what the position will be when 
you know, people's um, mentality, people's frame of mind is such that socialism is, is a distinct possibility. But uh, what's absolutely sure is that um, a lot of the um, paraphernalia of capitalism that, that exists now will, will not exist then, will be considerably weaker. And therefore, a lot of the obstacles we now see to establishing a different kind of society simply will not be there. They simply will not be there. Uh, there, there will probably need to be quite a long period of, uh, of, of, of preparation within capitalism before we get socialism. And uh, if it seems to people who want socialism within capitalism that the time isn't right, then you know, it may, they may decide that, no, we'll wait until it is. So, you know, we're gazing into crystal balls, but, and then, you know, we don't know exactly what the, what, what the position will be when uh, that moment comes. But what we do know is that uh, it will not make sense for capitalism to be uh, abolished and socialism established until the time is right to actually do it, until it can be established in a practical way. Anything from one of our, one of our visitors? Yes. Yeah. Alan Wigwigger. Um, I'm very interested in this idea that sort of socialism can be achieved by, um, not by force. Um, it seems to me that sort of, whenever you've, there is some sort of movement from below, uh, some threat to the powers of be, some threat to special interests, then those who control our society respond in a fairly time-honoured way. They beat the shit out of you. There's no doubt about that. And, and, and I'm seriously interested to know where those people that advocate bringing it out of socialism by the ballot box can tell me half a dozen examples of where that's occurred. Because I'd be very interested to hear about it, because I haven't heard any. Uh, and I'm talking about a study of the past, not crystal gazing into the future. Would anybody else like to say anything about that? Or I'll go first. All right. Um, I'd just like sorry. to say I do agree with this um, this man behind me that um, while you were talking about ballot boxes going to do this, one power corrupts. You know, anyone who's gone into power, from what I've read in history, and I haven't read a great deal, but just even modern day history, you know, they all turn against what they're really supposed to be doing, they're going to help someone else and it changes to a different situation. I think Ian, um, Ian Bones put this point across. They change their views on the, the class or the people they're supposed to be helping. But nowhere have I ever heard that going to Parliament has ever changed anything for the mass of the people. They usually get together in their little cliques, the power brokers, uh, with all this power that they have. And, you know, good intentions either don't manifest themselves or seem to go by the window. Animal Farm was one of the best films that kind of like showed how that all worked. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not happy with this parliamentary um, scope, to be honest. I don't see how it's going to work. But I don't like violence either. I don't think that's the answer either. And I like the Socialist Party, but that adamant it's, not, it's a non-violent party. Abolishing the state sounds nice, but how do you abolish a state where a capitalist society is adamant you will not have socialism? It's not going to happen. Mm. Um, what I'd sort of ask people to do is to think about the kind of revolution that the Socialist Party is advocating. Uh, and it's got sort of two or three different features. One of them is that it's a majority revolution. It's a revolution that the majority of people in the society want. It's a conscious revolution. In other words, people want it and they know what they want. Okay, that's the second thing. And um, the third thing is that they've planned how they will bring it about. Now, you say, what are the historical precedents for this? There aren't, that's the point. There aren't historical precedents. If, if, if there were historical precedents, for it, we, we would probably have it already. There aren't. The historical precedents, you can look at precedents where the there have been a minority which have tried to bring about a revolution. They've been faced with, with hostile, violent opposition from the state. Sometimes they've succeeded, sometimes they've failed. But whatever they've brought about, it hasn't been socialism. It hasn't been a majority revolution. It hasn't been 
something that was thought out in advance. And that's why previous revolutions have always failed. They've always, in a sense, even if, uh, uh, even if they seem to have succeeded, been more of the same. They've carried on what was happening before, sometimes in sort of marginally different ways, but that's what's happened. The point about the kind of revolution of the Socialist Party in the case is that it's qualitatively different from what's happened in the past. And it's qualitatively different because the majority want it, because people understand what they want, and because people are prepared to do what's necessary to bring it about. And in the circumstances, if a small minority did use violence to try and stop it, the vast majority might well have to oppose them in the same kind of way. But, uh, you know, uh, if 90% of the population clearly wants something, if they're prepared to take action to bring it about, it's hard to imagine that, you know, that the, the small minority who don't want it can actually do anything effectively against that conscious uh, majority who but are we the mass of the people, the working class, and there's a little minority who we don't want what they're offering, and yet they're in power doing quite well, thank We're you We're a very completely much. disorganised mass, and unfortunately most of us don't know what we want. Uh, some of us want what we're offering, some don't, some want this bit, some want that bit. We're disorganised. The point about socialism that people need is that people need to organise collectively for a common goal. That doesn't exist at the moment. Yeah, well, I totally agree with what the two said at the back on the, you know, the, the unfortunate necessity for violence. And, you know, the animal farm is a very good example of what happens to, to new rulers, and all well saw that in his time in Spain and what happened with the Communist Party. You know, there are some historic examples, but they don't concur with the SBG's viewpoint. I mean, the obvious one that comes to mind is the end day in Chile. Where he won a democratic, no, he wasn't an out and out revolutionary, but he won a democratic mandate for radical social change by the ballot box. Um, and what happened? You know, basically, if the ruling class within your own country doesn't get you, they'll find some allies with outside. So you can forget the picture of the end there on the balcony with gunners, American planes flew overhead, and uh, people were rammed up in football stadiums and put to death and shot. And, and you know, um, if there'd been some people have been more organised to fight back and a lot of people may not have been killed and uh, you know, it may have been a, a revolution may have occurred. I mean, the other thing is that you know, where do these organs of, you abolish the state, but where do these new forms or organs of working class power come from? They just come out of the blue, you know. Um, in, every, in every historic example there's been a revolution, you know, well, uh, attempt at a revolution. Workers' councils or Soviets or community councils, whatever you want, they are the forms which are always thrown out from Russia to Hungary, wherever you go. But, you know, people have had experience of these before capitalism has broken down. You know, when I talk of prefigurative forms of struggle, I'm talking about things which develop within the belly of the beast and which are ready to take power afterwards and exercise working class power. But, you know, the Socialist Party of Great Britain has just got some utopian view that can abolish the state. The army will say, okay, everyone will say, we're, the police will say we're abolished, the army will say, oh, we're abolished. You know, the capitalist class will say, well, we're abolished, fair enough, we've lost one seat in the by election, it's all over, comrades. I mean, you know, it defies absolutely beggars' belief to believe that, you know, you'd have to, you'd have to be of a certain, you know, ultra utopian mindset to believe that this was the real world that the Socialist Party of, uh, of, um, of Great Britain lives in. You know, what are the forms that work with last power that could be life and be organised under socialism? You know, you know it's things that still, you know, food production, communications, you know, we don't want to be sent into chaos. What are those forms? I've never heard anything from the Socialist Party of Great Britain. So what these new forms of organisation would be. You know, we don't say, well, let's have socialism, we can abolish the state. You know, and it's not, you know, if you, want, you might have a simple majority of parliament, but there's anti-social toll rags out there going to run them up. You know, what sort of... What sort of forms of organisation is that going to be dealt with? It seems to me that, you know, the, SD, the SPG verges on the sort of, you know, people who go up a mountain, the end of the world's going to come, you know, it's just, there's no... I mean, it's sadly disappointing when it doesn't. Right, and just before I take the next floor, I've got a couple of hands, but just, uh, we were asked for an example from the guy at the back, and I'll just step outside from the chair. I do have one example, which is the St. Louis Commune of 1877. Uh, I'll discuss it later. Best <laughs> 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 in the list. Yes, the, the example of Lendy is usually um, 
given, but in fact it, it doesn't give it doesn't make the case as you think it does or as he thinks it does, because um, if I remember correctly, and I think that Alenti was elected with about 43 or 47 percent of the vote uh, on the first occasion. In other words, he wasn't elected by, uh, in any case, wasn't elected by the majority of, of people going for socialism. There, there was a, a, it was a, a mixed group. Um, in the second uh, um, election, in fact, more people voted against uh, Avendi than voted for him. Um, it, and it, it had nothing to do with um, with getting socialism. It is not an, not an example in that way. Um, to get socialism, <laughs> you need socialists. And it has already been suggested that what will happen is that people will already have ideas about how the uh, new system has to be implemented in every sphere, which means that there will be socialists who have been in, in the army or maybe socialists still in the army, because I can't imagine that when these ideas take off, they will take off slowly. You know that we'll carry on getting the odd full May every uh, every other meeting or something. The, the idea is that some stage have to accelerate, and that is the, is the only way, as I see it, that, that it can happen. So there will be um, members of the armed forces will be soldiers, um, and the capitalist class <laughs> won't have. Uh, as it has now, workers to do everything that the system needs to be done. The workers will have decided, people will have decided that they're going to do it in their own interest, that the, the capitalist class is redundant anyway and it will be uh, completely redundant. The other thing about the socialist revolution is that it's not emphatically not a minority taking over in minority interest. It is taking over in the interest in, in the, of the whole of humankind. It, it's a, a revolution that doesn't mean anyone any harm. The, the capitalists can roll up their sleeves and, and, uh, and join in. <laughs> You've heard me ask a question before, you have understood I've only read one book and I can't remember it properly. But it's not a civilized, civilizing process. As I understand it, there's an elite and there's the outsiders. And uh, violence is used in order to get resources and the outsiders are used to keep the elite alive with food and shoe repairs or whatever. Now then, there was a, a movement from the outsiders, when they, I think they call it the bourgeoisie, when money started coming into the system and the bourgeoisie were attracted to the elite, not the other way around. Now then when I go to Surrey on a ride and look at the houses there, and I think, my God, I'd like one of those. And I question whether I am a socialist. <laughs> what are you going to do with the smart houses? Do you want to live in a high rise in Clapham? Or would you like one of these nice properties, properly renovated, um, in Surrey? How does socialism work? What's going to attract me to you? It's all very well having theories, because I, I would like to be able to make bread for you, because I enjoy making bread. But at the moment, I can't see how the majority of are going to attract that minority. Okay, that's probably just a bullet. Yeah, it's on this one here. Um, can I sort of um, begin to say something about a couple of in the inset and sort of that will sort of lead into that. So, a bit disappointed to hear Ian using this old smear term, utopian. Uh, it's the term that sort of tends to get used perhaps by worse detractors of which I don't think he is one, so we're a bit disappointed by that. Um, it you know, gets used by people who are, uh, on the whole, who are sort of very much um, in favour of capitalism and uh, completely opposed to the kind of ideas we're talking about. Uh, but anyway, he used it, maybe he wants to take me back, I don't know. Uh, 
but he sort of answered his own question in a way because he said that you never think about in terms of uh, things developing within the belly of the beast. Good expression, that. I'll remember that. We do, actually. We're always talking about how society might develop as socialist ideas spread and the kind of uh, for and, and the kind of organization that people might sort of you know de the kind of way people might, might decide they're going to organize themselves before socialism is actually established we do talk about that i mean we don't lay down how it's going to be because we don't know exactly i mean capitalism is a rapidly changing society in 50 years time uh, uh, the kind of society that exists today in capitalism if we've not got socialism by then, will probably seem sort of incredibly archaic. All sorts of things will have happened. I mean, who could have imagined what society was like, would be like today, capitalist society, 40, 50 years ago? Uh, you know, massive things have happened, haven't they? So it's impossible to lay down precisely what, you know, what the future's going to be like and the kind of forms that people, the, the way people will organise, you know, on the way to socialism, but we're not averse to talking about that. We, we talk about it a lot, in fact. We simply don't lay things down, uh, and, and you know it, it, would, it would be quite, quite wrong to do so. Um, and um, you know, so the idea that we think we're going to pass immediately from this kind of society we've got now to the kind of society we advocate without anything changing is it, it, it's not right. It, it's a misunderstanding, uh, if, if I can be polite, at least anyway, uh, of what our view of the way society works and the, the way socialism uh, uh, will come about is. Uh, now, the uh, contributor just now said, uh, okay, how are we gonna convince people that socialism is worth having when there are some people living in high-rise flats and some living in sort of big houses in Surrey? You know, I want a big house in Surrey. Uh, okay, I wouldn't mind a big house in Surrey, but uh, it, it depends. I mean, socialism is not a society in which people will be able to have absolutely everything they want. They'll be able to have what's available. Our, humor, our argument is that enough will be available. Enough is probably available already if the means of production were sort of used in uh, you know, a, a reasonable way in order to you know, accommodate people's needs. But uh, uh, you know, that's a detail which will need to be dealt with when we've got socialism, I mean, you know, not everybody will want to live in a big house in Surrey. Some will, some won't. And it may well be that it gets decided that big houses in, in, in Surrey are shared between a number of people. No individual can have sort of such a big house. I don't know. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that uh, the resources are available now, and uh, you know, class war itself says that, if used in a way uh, to satisfy people's needs. They are available uh, in order to provide for us uh, in a throughout the whole population of the world in a very comfortable way. Uh, Ian raised the point that if we try and bring that about in this country, then even if the capitalist class here uh, can't, uh, uh, aren't capable of sort of uh, stopping it, somebody will step in from outside. But the whole idea, the whole idea of socialism, it's got to be a world system. You've got to have this kind of idea spreading sort of generally throughout the world, otherwise you can't possibly achieve it can't exist in one country, that's absolutely fundamental to socialism, and that's one of the reasons why we are very much opposed to organisations who somehow think you can have a different kind of society in one country, and it's one of the things I thought that class war were absolutely adamant about, that we're talking about, you know, a spread of ideas worldwide, not in a particular uh, geographical area. Well, you know, um, Funny enough, I, I live in Croydon, which used to be in Surrey. It's the same. I do live in a house in Surrey. There's obviously one in Cumbit and Sunningdale, we're going to live in the house. Where we like to go. Double answer this time. I think behind my question was the production of things that are beautiful. Do we not get Rolls Royces anymore? Do we not get. <laughs> No, you won't get a lot of noise. Well, if you want one, you have to clean so the choice. Losing, losing yeah. Well, you will lose out. When, 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 when I'm talking about wealth, I'm talking about, about when, you know, we're, 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 the pro champions. we're prioritised, you know, with, with like 80% of the world starving, putting resources into producing Rolls Royces, beautiful as though they may be, and beautiful as, you know, the state and other maybe, and diamonds, and beautiful as Damien Hurst paintings, probably 80 million quid a throw are. 
and you know, in the socialist society, decisions we make the priorities, and the priorities we given to stop people starving to death. You know, that's, you know, so the, we, you know, the, the kind of choice you're talking about is a capitalist choice, you're not talking about a socialist choice. But it seems to me you're quite happy under capitalism. You know, they give you choice. You know, you can either starve in one country or ride around a row in another. Right. Um, uh, the state system hand at the back. Yeah, I mean, it, it's true there's never been uh, a socialist majority, so the thing doesn't, uh, you know, you apply. But there have been plenty of cases where there's been a majority in favour of something, and the government has, has had to give way. I mean, there, there are two recent examples of that. One is also uh, from Latin America. In, 19, in 2002, there was a coup against the uh, uh, Chavez government in uh, uh, Venezuela. Well, what happened? The, the people showed that they were on, on the side of the government and the, uh, and, and the plotters gave in. So that, no, know, no, they didn't vote against them, they physically went out okay, and yes, physically yes. got in that. Yes, yes. That's, well, that's, so physically, yeah, that's right. not by voting. That's right. So, I mean, <laughs> so the point I'm saying is a government cannot defy uh, a majority uh, which is against it. I mean, if they try to, people uh, you know, uh, demonstrating in, 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 in the streets and so on. And you know, the second historically uh, example of that is the collapse of state capitalism in Eastern Europe. You know, the, the, you know, two of the more conservative regimes there were the old Brexit in, in East Germany and the other one in, uh, uh, in Czechoslovakia. What happened? They could have chosen to resist if they wanted to, but they realized that the, uh, you know, the game was up. And they, and they abandoned power to what the majority wanted. Now, there was one dictator in uh, Eastern Europe who decided to try and resist what the majority wanted. He was called uh, Ceausescu. He lasted a week. <laughs> a week later, he was hanging from a line post. So I don't think that, that, that if you've got a majority, um, you know, the, the government can be what they want. They, 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 they can't turn things off like that. You know, I, I agree this is, this is, you know, it, it wasn't a case of social, but it was a case of a majority wanting something, and the government, or a little, you know, the ruling league having, having to give way to the majority, more or less peacefully. Anyone come back on that? Or we are This is probably the last, unless there's anyone else particularly desperate. Right, so I'll, I'll take you as desperate after that. Right. Uh, th th I'll just get to get back to uh, the, the issue of, uh, of uh, luxury goods that are supposedly wanted by the working class after socialism has been achieved. I think uh, a fairly important point has uh, at least been partly missed here, and that is that uh, goods like uh, huge stockbroker houses in, in Surrey, Ferraris, Lamborghinis and Rolls Royces are only uh, sought after by certain people, even in capitalism. Admittedly, it could be said that a large number of people would like to get their hands on things like that if they could. But that is because they've been brainwashed by uh, the capitalist advertising media into considering that large houses and fast sports cars are desirable. Now, we're talking about a, a, a fundamental uh, mindset change that the majority of the population would have made to actually make the uh, transformation from capitalism to socialism feasible. And I can't imagine for one moment that once the majority of the population have seen through the, uh, the, the, the fallacy of the, uh, uh, and the falsehood of the capitalist advertising media as well as the capitalist system itself that there are going to be millions of people clambering for uh, Ferraris and, and large houses. And another thing, uh, yeah, each people, uh, people have got uh, different individual needs uh, and the point is that if you wanted a, a very large house with say uh, uh, 20 uh, bedrooms and uh, uh, 300 acres as your back garden or something like that. Who's going to look after it? <laughs> it? It might sound very nice to have, an, uh, uh, to have a house like that, but remember, we're not going to have servants and skivvies under socialism. So, uh, so this person, uh, these people, they move into their large uh, stockbroker houses under socialism 
and uh, then a, a little bit of dust appears on the furniture. <laughs> uh, a few days later, the dust gets thicker, and they, they start uh, dusting these things, and they think, oh yeah, but I've only done this bedroom. I've got, an I've got another 19 bedrooms still to dust. Maybe a few months later, they think to themselves, wasn't well, such a good idea having this uh, huge... Bre well, I could have had all I read. I've only got uh, two kids. I've, I've, there are only three or four people in my family. There's a more modest-sized house or perhaps even a flat down the road. So I, I don't see that this is going to be uh, uh, any significant problem uh, under socialism, apart from what's already uh, been mentioned uh, by in the fact that uh, a, a socialist society will have completely different uh, priorities, uh, housing uh, and feeding the poor and bringing, uh, giving us all uh, decent living standards. Uh, th th those will be far more important than thinking about uh, building big houses and, uh, uh, and sports cars. Okay, right, the last contribution from the floor. Yeah, um, I've got a question um, about the events of this week or the last 10 days or so. The, the, the mainstream media has portrayed um, the last week in, in Wall Street and on the city as being a, a mini collapse of capitalism. Um, I'm interested to know what your two movements make of it, whether you see it as, as a sort of mini collapse or, and as some kind of opportunity or just as an irrelevance and just a blip in, in, sort of in, in, um, in capitalism. Yeah, I think capitalism is endlessly adaptable. Uh, I've, I've never saw it as a crisis in capitalism. It's really weird because at the same time as, um, as um, the stock market was crashing and Lehman Brothers and the rest of the games. And then the Swanee, I was actually at Sotheby's looking at Bailey Nurse. And the amount of greed and inquisitiveness on it, there was a couple of sort of yuppie types that obviously didn't know anything about art and Sotheby's lackeys. And all these who's of the car really made of solid gold, although yes, they're writing it all down ready for a corporate bid. So they went for 110 million. I mean, people have taken their money out of stocks and shares, stuck them into Damien Hurst, into Banksy, into gold, you know, and they're, they're going to switch back again when everything's easy. So it was never um, the collapse of capitalism and the great, you know, the play was portrayed as the most shocking day since the last most shocking day. Um, and I've never thought anyway that, you know, that, the working class will be bounced into socialism by abject misery, you know, they're really impoverished. And just as like they go in the opposite direction to fascism as we are, they suddenly become socialist because of the economic circumstances. So, yeah, that's just an answer to your question. Um, I'm, I'm, I might as well pick up the other kettle from the so like, My dad was a butler, so um, I'm interested in the abolition of servants. <laughs> <laughs> but it's your theory that the capitalist class will give up their wealth because of too much dust. Or well, my theory that they give up their wealth because they're straight up from the fucking rafters of their mansion. I think I know. I think I know which is the more realistic one. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, <laughs> with Ian's answer to the question about the sort of economic crisis, so called over the last. Uh, we got to kind of just add a couple of things. Uh, um, the Socialist Party has always said um, that, um, social, that the capitalism goes through a boom slump cycle uh, and it's impossible to foresee quite when a boom will end and the slump will begin, etc. And we don't know at the moment whether you know that the slump isn't going to get deeper just because there seems to be a sort of rescue and shares have gone up this week. Who knows what the future holds? But uh, if you compare what's happened this week to what happened in 1929, you know, the, the, uh, the world slump uh, uh, that, that began then, what happened then was that uh, basically governments didn't rescue the stock market, they didn't rescue the banks, etc. What governments now have done is, is apparently rescued them. Uh, and it's a slightly different way of going about things. But uh, can I say that this is very much in line with the view that... Uh, the Socialist Party is always taken of the state. What's the role of the state? The role of the state is to support capitalism, to keep it going. 
uh, in various different ways. Uh, the state collects these taxes from the capitalist class in order to fund the system. It doesn't collect taxes from the working class, although it, it, it might seem that they do. They collect taxes from the capitalist class. Uh, and what they're doing now is spending some of those taxes, and they'll probably need to raise more from the capitalist class, in order to shore up the, 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 these banks that have collapsed. So it's simply what's happened this last week is simply another example of the capitalist class uh, taking action on behalf of a certain, uh, sorry, the government taking action on behalf of a certain section of the capitalist class to support the capitalist system as a whole. Whether they will succeed or not in sort of achieving the kind of balance that uh, maybe has existed over the last sort of 20 or 30 years, it's hard to know. Maybe they're, in the end it won't work and there will be another crash as in the late 20s and early 30s. It remains to be seen. But uh, no, I mean, this is the kind of thing that happens within capitalism and uh, you know it's not the kind of situation as Ian uh, has just said which will somehow lead to sort of great radicalism among workers you know it could as Ian said it could just as well lead to, to, to you know to fascism as to some kind of sort of higher consciousness right um, so we're nearing the end so I suggest uh, give both speakers a final chance to raise or come back to any points they want to um, and then we call it an end. So, do you have anything you want to further say? Very briefly. Yeah, why is Brian Flynn after his bizarre to control the state which we're not so exposed? Brian, 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 <laughs> so, so, sorry, you, you fled after your attempt to take over the state was defeated. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, comrade, uh, the, the point raised by the back about Chavez and um, the other one, what's the other one? Chavez. Yeah, I mean, they weren't, as you say, they weren't, the people weren't based there. People were shouting at Chavezka before stringing them up, weren't saying, give us a ballot. They were saying, you tow rag who's exposed us for these, your time is up, you're going to get what's coming in. And Chavez, you know, but, Although, you know, we can argue about Chavez being a socialist or not. In fact, you know, the, the tactic was he was physically, you know, the coup was physically defeated. It wasn't defeated by calling for a ballot. I mean, that said, I mean, I'm sure you're so... I'm sure you, within the Socialist Party, they've been the arguments always come back to these things. And your point about the end was well made as well. I mean, I'm trying to think of other examples. And perhaps the, <laughs> I don't think off the top of it, the Grenadian Revolution, the Americans were the Grenada when it was a popular revolution there. But I'm sure you're so used to you know, all these arguments around uh, seizing control of the state and about it. I would like to return to the complementary bits of uh, what I started with. So I do think that the SBGB have got an articulated vision of socialism which is humanistic and caring and loving and words like that, which you rarely use. Um, and I think you need to hang on to that and I respect your um, Ability over the near 100 years or whatever not to get sidetracked and doing it up as nasty vanguard Trotsky. So, respect for that. Kind of There's snacks and nibbles and things upstairs. There's a, a monkey old hat going around that you can put money in if you like. <laughs>